You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Friday, May 22nd. We're sharing local news and resources, focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. Beginning next week, this show will air live at noon on Tuesdays only. You can catch many other public affairs and music programs live on the air on KDIRT or streamed and archived at kdrt.org. Today is episode 20. If you find yourself tuning in for the kind of local content and perspectives we highlight on the COVID-19 Community Report or appreciate the many ways that Davis Media Access and KDRT provide support and leadership in our community, then please visit our website, davismedia.org. We'll get you there and to Catered and everything else and click the donate button. Give us some likes and follows on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram as well, where you also find lots of local information and resources. And thank you. My guest today is Dr. Jana Mazet of One Health Institute at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, and we will get to that interview in just a few minutes. So much local news this week. Yolo County received the okay from the state to reopen additional businesses, including retail and indoor dining at restaurants. The Yolo County Board of Supervisors will delineate the public health guidelines for this next level of reopening at its regular meeting next week, so don't go looking for that those openings to be in place this weekend. And while the California State University announced last week that it's moving to online-only instruction for the fall, the UC is planning for at least some in-person classes. University of California President Janet Napolitano said Wednesday that every UC campus will be open and offering instruction this fall, despite the coronavirus outbreak that shuttered uh, campus activity across the state. The question will be how much of that instruction is in person versus how much is done remotely. Napolitano said she anticipates that most, if not all, of our campuses will operate in some kind of hybrid mode. The pandemic has caused a $1.2 billion loss system-wide from the time the campuses shut down in the middle of March through the end of April, and not to mention the collateral damage to businesses and communities the students had to vacate, such as Davis. In another big announcement this week, UC will no longer require students to submit SAT or ACT test scores as part of its admissions process. The UC Board of Regents voted unanimously Thursday, um, yesterday, in a historic decision likely to have national ripple effects. Instead, the nine UC campuses plan to develop by 2025 a new standardized, standardized test for California residents that will better reflect what students learn in school and mitigate racial biases and inequities the critics say the SAT and ACT exacerbate. Yolo County is designated a state testing site for COVID-19, and that testing is available in Woodland through May 30th and then moves to West Sacramento until June 20th. This is not antibody testing, to be clear, but it's a test for COVID-19, and it's available by appointment only. The, the how-tos for getting these appointments and what you need to do once you get there are, are many and necessarily very particular in an effort to keep people safe. You can get more info at 888-634-1123 or by visiting Logistics Health Incorporated at lhi.care slash COVID testing. And the county announced this week that Dr. Ron Chapman will retire from his position as public health officer effective June 30th. Dr. Chapman retires after 35 years of service, the past five in Yolo County. Yolo County's Deputy Health Officer, Dr. Mary Ann Limbos, will serve as interim until a permanent health officer is hired. Dr. Limbos has worked for the Yolo County since uh, June 2016 and has provided significant leadership during the COVID-19 crisis as well. I've interviewed her on this show. But from all of us to Dr. Chapman, I'd like to say thanks for your leadership through the pandemic and your participation participation here at Davis Media Access. As always, yolocounty.org for all county-related COVID-19 info. Well, let's take a minute for music before our interview. All right. 
Dr. Jana Mazet is an American epidemiologist and executive director of the University of California Davis One Health Institute at the School of Veterinary Medicine, where she is professor of epidemiology and disease ecology. She focuses on global health problem solving, especially for emerging infectious disease and conservation challenges. She is a leader in the field of One Health, which she'll tell us about, and is versed in microbial and pandemic threats. And she is the global director of the PREDICT project, a viral emergence early warning project that has been developed with the United States Agency for International Development's Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Adam. Um, you're a bit of a rock star. It actually seems like you've spent your career preparing for just this moment in time. Well, ideally, I was preparing my whole life and working really hard to never have this moment. Yeah. Um, so, um, unfortunately, we're here, um, and I, I wish I wish we weren't. But that doesn't make all the preparations uh, invalid. They're, they've been super helpful, and we've seen how much the the global workforce that we've been able to support has really been able to respond mm -hmm. and be heroes in this terrible tragedy. Yeah. So you are an expert in a field called One Health, and you head an institute bearing that name. Let's start with defining what that means. Sure. So One Health has a couple of central tenets. One is that we bring all of the brilliance that different disciplines have to offer together to work on problems. So instead of the academic historical way of doing business, of everybody going into their lab or their team and work on one small little piece of the puzzle, we actually bring those people together. Um, so collaboration is key. And what do we collaborate on? That's the other central tenet. Well, we collaborate on those big audacious problems that are really focused at the nexus of human, animal, plant, and environmental health. And um, zoonotic diseases are those diseases that can go between animals and people, like this terrible COVID-19 disease mm -hmm. is a perfect example of where we really need the One Health approach in order to um, get ahead of them and then solve and, and address them when they happen. So it's about interconnectedness, but with really good data and analysis to back it up. Absolutely. So uh, it's 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 the data, but also what we do with the data, how mm -hmm. we um, how we analyze it, how we put it into action. So you need the policymakers, the economists, the social scientists that we sometimes um, can leave out when we're thinking. Again, just you know, I'm an epidemiologist. I work on patterns of disease in population, animal and human populations. Um, I may not have in my early career thought enough about the dynamic of people's choices and how they make those choices mm -hmm. and the impact on their social well-being and mental health and all of those things we know now are so important. Hmm. So how does this, this uh, One Health approach, how does that knowledge inform predicting future outbreaks? Well, we know that uh, the majority of emerging infectious diseases arise um, from animal populations. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, when we say an emerging infectious disease, that means as people, we haven't seen it before. Mm -hmm. It's new to us. And so it is in the animal populations, and specifically and most importantly in the wildlife population, where we see the majority of those uh, organisms that turn out to be human pathogens spilling over and making us sick. So from a One Health perspective, you can't just think about the human health side. If you do, you wait every time mm -hmm. until you have an outbreak, and then you try to figure out what it is, waste weeks to months, and then, oh my goodness, we don't have diagnostics, we don't have therapeutics, we don't have you know, vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, if you only focus on the animal side, you might find a lot of um, microorganisms. They have their, their uh, microbiome. And it's hard to know whether those uh, viruses for this purpose are pathogenic to other species other than the ones they evolved in. So obviously, you need the human and animal side. On the environmental side, you really need to think about the drivers for those connections that cause exposure risk. 
Mm-hmm. So we definitely know that as we alter land use and we push out into new environments, because we're almost 8 billion, we're forecasted to be 9.5 billion people on this beautiful blue globe um, very soon, um, that we are going to take up more and more land and we're going to use the resources of the land differently. Those activities that we do really stress our systems, and they put us at risk for exposure because we're going into new places, meeting Mm. up with new species. But also, the stressors on the systems make us a little more susceptible, and it makes those other hosts, the wildlife specifically, more likely to be shedding or releasing virus that can be transmissible to people into that environment. So all these things working together are critically important to understand. Sure, because if you radically transform an environment, say by clear-cutting a rainforest, you're, you're going to affect every system and every living being within that, and then they're, exactly. going, to, they're going to be stressed and their behavior is going to change either intentionally or, or not um, as mm-hmm. a result. One of the most and we know for bats specifically, that causes them to increase their reproductive rate. Mm-hmm. And we also know because of all this decade-long work we've done with the PREDICT project that um, that reproductive period, especially when the, the dams or the, the bat mothers are weaning their pups or their bat babies, um, that's when we see uh, the majority of virus transmission and the exposure risk. So we don't want to increase their reproductive rate and put right. more virus into the environment. So interesting. You just mentioned the the PREDICT platform, so let's talk about that for a minute and help our listeners understand what that effort is about. Sure. So for um, now almost 11 years, uh, we have at UC Davis had the honor of leading an international consortium, um, 35 countries all around the world, Uh, working to build up the system to um, be able to identify viruses early, preferably before they spill over or at their sources of spillover, and be ready to respond. Uh, In this unfortunate case, we hadn't been working in the area where it appears um, the SARS coronavirus 2 started, Mm -hmm. Um, so we hadn't pre-identified that virus. But we had been working um, all around that area, had identified many coronaviruses, 100, more than 100 actually, coronaviruses, about 100 of them new um, to science. Uh, And we were certainly waving the flag and saying, hey, let's get ready, let's have systems in place to be able to respond um, right away and to, to be able to monitor and start to understand which ones of these are the highest likelihood of causing human disease. Mm -hmm. Um, That didn't happen. Political wills needed as well as the science. Uh, But what did happen was that the PREDICT team in China and Southeast Asia and Africa um, were trained and ready to use our um, platform to detect virus. So those were the first people that were called in to help um, identify the virus and identify introduced cases into countries like Thailand and Nepal, and even in Africa to rule out COVID-19 in some of the people traveling from China and Asia into the countries with colds and other symptoms to say, no, these people don't have it. So they, the, the teams were able to help their country so early, mm-hmm. even before we had full sequence and a good diagnostic test. And now they are still helping Um, providing technical assistance around PPE, um, knowledge around coronaviruses, uh, infectious disease prevention and control in their countries, um, and diagnostics. So we're proud that our team is helping to kind of be like the global immune system Mm -hmm. um, and attacking the problem uh, for most countries where the where our teams were working early before the the problems were totally out of control in their countries. Yeah, it's kind of mind blowing. I read that this consortium uh, you've been talking about the work's been carried out in more than thirty five countries, and the the sheer number of viruses you all have identified to someone who is is not uh, you know scientifically minded, it was stunning to read about that. Yeah, more, about 1,200 viruses we identified. Uh, the majority of those are new to science, um, but some of them, the ones that aren't new to science, 
um, the discoveries that we made around those are just as important because we identified things like Ebola and Marburg virus, which is an incredibly deadly virus in the same filovirus family as Ebola. We identified some of those in areas where they didn't know they occurred. So where they knew Marburg was deadly and caused outbreaks in East Africa, all the way across the continent, they didn't know that they had Marburg virus. And we were able to find it, make sure their clinicians knew that if they saw any strange cases that Marburg should be on their differential diagnosis list, they should be able to test for it and do surveillance because they had the actual pathogen in their country. Hmm. So we really feel, again, this is, again, like that global immune system, um, making sure the system knows something's coming. And I guess the clinicians in the laboratories are kind of like if they had antibodies, right? They're ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so we're really, again, really, really proud um, of that. The other thing is the, our ability to detect these novel viruses and start to rank them for their likelihood of spillover um, and, uh, and then going human to human spread, causing epidemics and pandemics. We recognized that it was that we were just scratching the surface, that we were just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And um, what we really needed to do was build a powerful global coalition of um, countries, agencies, NGOs, universities like ours that mm -hmm. are willing to work on this problem. And we now know that we can do it. We can identify virus early and ahead of time. Um, and we just need to work together to find all the virus in the world and get governments to be prepared and ready for them. So it, I, it sounds like along with uh, the climate crisis, and, and I'm sure there's a relationship here between the outbreak of viruses and, and climate, um, this is the, the work really of the century ahead, and, and we're going to have to... Um, you know, up our game in terms of preparing for rapid response. And as you've said, understanding and being able to evaluate how some viruses are more risky than, than others. I think so. If we don't, shame on us. We'll just be in the same situation over and over and over again. And I, I know that I never want to see uh, families, including my own, devastated by something like this again. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about the recent, uh, let's see, it was May 2nd, UC Global Health Day, which was a virtual conference. But I was very interested by some of the description of this, um, that it focused on topical insights related to COVID-19, including animal to human transmission of viruses and resulting pandemics, which we've been talking about, and gender and socioeconomic disparities. And I, and I also know that, that you presented at that, and if you could talk a little bit about what your angle was there, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of my um, points was was certainly um, around those of the viruses that are yet to come, which we've just talked about yeah. a bit more. Um, also about how important biodiversity and conservation is, how important bats are, um, that people need to understand, um, you know, how to live safely with animals so that we don't get ourselves in this situation. So spoke about that. But on the on the um, the parts that we haven't talked about much today, uh, gender, um, uh, racial equity, um, mental health, I really believe that, that the economic disruption as well as the isolation um, that we are seeing with this um, terrible pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, they're our next pandemic, right? So mm. the, the poverty, and the, um, the terrible depression that's resulting for many from isolation or worry around economics is equally important to the health and disease and death that we're seeing from the disease. So um, we really need to, again, have our systems prepared not just for infectious diseases but for the rest of the consequences that go along with that. Actually, if we were prepared enough for the infectious side, we could prevent, which is what I'm all about, right? Preventing yep. the infectious disease, which also prevents the mental health and the economic disruption. So um, so these are all big parts of it. Also, we are uh, acutely aware that um, folks who tend to have less of a voice in our society are being disproportionately 
affected. Mm -hmm. Um, So certainly hourly workers, uh, wage workers tend to be both the ones that lose their jobs first uh, in these economic crises, but also the ones that are asked to work in maybe what could be perceived as more risky circumstances than others. So it makes sense that those folks are the ones that we are seeing more in the hospital or Mm -hmm. coming down as cases. I think what's devastating is we're also seeing a a higher proportion among those cases of people um, hospitalized in ICUs and severely debilitated and potentially dying um, in those uh, ethnic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, that tend to um, be underrepresented in society and maybe don't have the best access to health care or all the information um, about how to protect themselves. So um, so this is going to put a sort of shine a light on um, racial and gender disparities. We know that uh, women are bearing the, the brunt of um, a lot of the isolation Mm -hmm. um, because women tend to be doing more of the homeschooling and doing more of the, um, uh, you know, child care while also trying to do their jobs from home. So I I know there are a lot of really wonderful fathers. I'm not trying to say that (laughs) that's, uh, uh, that it's not that folks aren't all pulling their weight, but um, the data show us that there are disparities there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about the next wave that's coming to you. And I I know you're also a mom. Something I've been thinking about is, you know, we have millennials who who are the generation of kids raised after 9-11, and we know how that shaped their lives. Now we have a generation of of kids take this year's high school classes and and college graduates who can't celebrate, you know, those milestones in, in traditional ways and whose very formative years in school this this year has been twisted and shaped in unimaginable ways. So I, I can only imagine what we'll be staring down the barrel of as, as time progresses. Yeah, it's tragic. I mean, for maybe us people, I'm in my early 50s. For me, you know, thinking about, you know, your high school graduation or your college graduation is, is not seemingly an earth-shattering thing. But when your frame of reference is you work so hard for your entire life and your whole perception is getting to some of these milestones and and missing out on all of those um, amazing touch points in life like prom and you know state championships of uh, you know sporting teams yeah. and your you know your graduations is significant and for the millennials it's really significant I have uh, four millennials uh, sheltering with me my two adult daughters and their partners Mm -hmm. uh, are all here with me and my husband, which is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. I have an access to my adult children and their partners in an intense and um, lovely way that I would have never had if this hadn't happened. But I also can see what they're going through. And as you mentioned, you know, they've, they've had to already go through a lot, including economic hardships, finding jobs, and now many of them are also uh, losing their livelihoods or having to cut their pay, um, they're you know they're just facing a lot of stressors, and they're a population that have already faced stressors in their young lives. So um, it will shape our our future. Um, all of these issues. Yeah, and it comes back to just how interconnected everything is, and everyone mm-hmm. is. We're we're about out of time, uh, so let me just end by asking you what comes next for you in your work. Well, um, that that uh, global co- coalition I mentioned mm-hmm. is really what I think I need to focus on for the future. And we're calling that the Global Virome Project. Um, people can uh, find out more at globalvironproject.org, all one word. Okay. Um, and um, we, we really believe that it is possible to get ahead of these viral issues and understand them and be ready for them. And um, there are people all over this planet that want to help with that. Uh, We need support, but we also need political will. And that means all citizens uh, sort of understanding and getting behind uh, this idea that that we can um, we can find viruses. We can be ready for them. We can put the systems in place to be ready to detect and diagnose anything that comes our way so that we can control things at their source rather than let them get horribly out of control. So 
that's that's I think the future. Uh, it won't be just me. It's going to need to be, you know, thousands of people all over the world working for this, and um, we welcome uh, we welcome participation and support. All right. Well. Yours is an important perspective, and we're lucky to have you here at UC Davis and the Veterinary School. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. Thanks for having me, and have a great weekend. All right. Take care. This is Dr. Jana Mazet of the One Health Institute, UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, what I said it earlier, but what a rock star. Boy, she's doing important work. And I appreciate the, the connection she drew to what we're facing socially and as communities, as families, as individuals. So let me, on that note, let me wrap up with a couple of announcements here. Uh, this spring sees a lot of schools and learning communities missing out on those milestones that mark important transitions. The Davis community will rally together from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. next Friday, May 29th for the Class of 2020 Davis Celebration and Pickup Event a safe and social distancing event. It will include cap and gown pickup for seniors. Organizers are working with local law enforcement to shut down 14th Street. Tentatively, there will be a route for elementary school families to drive through the North Davis Elementary lot, junior high families in the library lot, and high school families through the Vets Memorial lot, waving and, and uh, flashing signs and having a good time uh, while being safe. It will be followed by a community-wide celebration with businesses and residents cheering our graduates on. A program of recorded music and shout-outs will air from 10 a.m. to noon here on Catered, and Davis Media Access will be out documenting the event. You want to get involved? You can email davispickupcelebration at gmail.com for more info or to get involved. And finally, I'm going to encourage you to go to davisphoenixco.org. The Davis Pride Celebration had to be canceled this year, but they have a plan for rainbows and joy throughout the month of June. And there's more I can say there, but I'm running out of time. So davisphoenixco.org. Thanks for tuning in. I will be back next Tuesday with Ryan Collins, the Homeless Outreach Coordinator for the City of Davis, and Sebastian Onyate, Editor for the Davis Enterprise. From the KDRT studio, I'm Autumn Labbe-Renault, and this has been the COVID-19 Community Report.